From the whimsical world of Flash games to the hallowed halls of roguelike fame, the journey of Kenny and Teddy Lee is a tale fit for the annals of indie game development. I'm your host, Krator, and today we'll explore how these brothers' philosophy of good, not perfect, gave birth to Rogue Legacy and left their mark on a generation of games. The Lee brothers, Kenny and Teddy, began their adventure in the pixelated playground of Flash games. Like many hopeful developers in the early 2000s, they honed their skills on small browser-based projects, where the stakes were low and the possibilities were as bottomless as any bag of holding. These humble beginnings were a vital training ground, allowing them to tinker with game mechanics and storytelling without the looming shadow of big budgets or the dreaded publisher's deadlines. Their first breakthrough came with a game that broke wind in the most unexpected way. Don't Shit Your Pants was a simple yet uproariously engaging flash game that tickled the fancy of many a web browser. It's a game about trying to, well, not shit your pants before you make it to the toilet. All done through an old school text adventure format. Just be sure to pull your pants down before sitting on the throne. Its success was a pivotal moment for the Lee brothers, proving that their quirky ideas and design philosophy could indeed resonate with players, much like a bard's catchy tune. Riding the wave of this unexpected hit, Kenny and Teddy set their sights on more ambitious projects. They began to dabble in more intricate game mechanics and longer development cycles, all while preserving their distinctive approach to game design. A blend of whimsy, challenge, and a dash of the unexpected. They went on to develop a few more bite-sized affairs, one called Villainous, a strategy game where you take the role of the big bad and use monsters and other devious tricks to take over the land. I Have One Day was a point-and-click adventure where you need to save the kingdom in a single day from a matter the character can't even recall. The gameplay features some trollish moon logic that even got meta, like needing to mute the game itself to silence a rather loud person. My first Quantum Translocator was a creative momentum-based platformer where you're able to drop quantum shadow that you can teleport back to at any moment while keeping all the current momentum intact. One game that never saw the light of release was Band of Bears, a co-op puzzling beat-em-up where the players explored a land to find gold while smashing enemies. Last up was a couple puzzle games for iOS. Tribal Tally had players tapping numbers in order repeatedly with varying rule sets, and Q was a more traditional puzzle game where players drummed sets of colored tiles to make them disappear and cause what's above to fall and hopefully make chains. As we'll see, the journey from Flash to Fame wasn't just about creating bigger games, it was about honing their craft and ultimately shaping the future of the roguelike genre. The Lee brothers were on the cusp of embarking on a project that would test their mettle like nothing before, and in doing so, they would carve their names into the budding indie game landscape. But they didn't just one day wake up and decide to make a roguelike. In fact, their initial inspiration came from what is nowadays, at least, a not-so-unexpected source. Kenny and Teddy were big fans of the notoriously difficult Demon Souls and Dark Souls games. These challenging action games got the brothers thinking. What if they could capture the same sense of brutal difficulty and progress through failure, but in a 2D format? And as Teddy Lee put it, The super original idea came from Demon Souls and Dark Souls. We wanted to make a 2D version of it. However, crafting a 2D Dark Souls is no mere task of flattening out the third dimension like a pancake. The brothers swiftly discovered that translating the intricate world design of the Souls series into 2D was akin to trying to squeeze an elephant into a teapot. Their first attempt featured interconnected rooms and treasure chests, much like a Metroidvania. However, this approach hit a major snag, as Teddy candidly put it. We realized if we spent a year on it, we'd have like one-tenth of the game done. So we scrapped it. Hiccup nudged the Lee brothers back into the drawing board, where they pondered how to conjure a vast challenging world without spending eons meticulously crafting each nook and cranny. The solution? Procedural generation. By dynamically generating the castle layout for each run, the brothers found a way to increase the replay value without blowing their budget. This decision was crucial, allowing them to balance the scope of the game with their limited resources as an indie duo. Throughout development, they were perpetually reevaluating their grand designs, trimming the overly ambitious and salvaging the gems that could still shine brightly. This pragmatic approach ensured that Rogue Legacy remained a manageable beast, never threatening to gallop beyond their control. However, merely reshuffling rooms wasn't enough to make Rogue Legacy stand out. The Lou brothers aspired to create a sense of progression that would lure players back, even after countless defeats. Enter the game's piece de resistance. 
the family lineage system. With this mechanic, every death in the game isn't just a setback. It's a chance to pass on traits to a new generation of heroes. This clever twist gave players a reason to keep pushing forward, even when the castle loomed as an insurmountable fortress. This is where their good, not perfect philosophy really shone through. Instead of spending months fine-tuning every possible room combination, they focused on creating a system that was fun and engaging, even if it wasn't flawless. They aimed for cheap, fast, and reusable solutions that allowed them to efficiently develop the game without getting bogged down in endless tweaking. This philosophy stemmed from their experience making smaller Flash games before tackling Rogue Legacy. They learned valuable lessons about efficiency and prioritization that would prove crucial when taking on a more ambitious project. But make no mistake, good not perfect didn't mean cutting corners or producing a subpar product. The journey from initial concept to finished product wasn't always smooth. But the Lee brothers' commitment to their vision never wavered, even when the journey exacted a personal toll. For this was no mere brisk flash escapade. Indeed, the development of Rogue Legacy was a considerable leap from their previous endeavors. As Kenny put it, That's the risk you take when you're making nothing but original games. They can do well, or they can do poorly. But with flash games, it's a different kind of risk. With Rogue Legacy, we spent 18 months developing it, not knowing what's going to happen. Our biggest project previously has four months, so at about that point in Rogue Legacy, we were wondering whether we'd make it to the end. Because on a game this large, at that point we've gotten nowhere. This uncertainty was more than a mental challenge. It had tangible consequences. Throughout the 18 months of Odyssey, Kenny and Teddy had to balance their dreams with the practicalities of life. To fund this ambitious endeavor, the brothers had some rather serious lifestyle adjustments. Teddy took on part-time work to keep the cauldron bubbling, while Kenny focused full-time on breathing life into Rogue Legacy. But that was merely the tip of their cost-cutting iceberg. In true any developer fashion, Kenny and Teddy embraced a frugal lifestyle that would make even the most stringent budgeter blush. They lived together to save on rent, shared expenses whenever possible, and even went without luxuries like cell phones. It's a stark reminder that behind every indie success story, there's often a tale of personal sacrifice and ramen noodles. Kenny had this to say in an interview with Eurogamer. We have no expenses, no cell phones, we stay at home working, but a lot of the funding actually came from Teddy because he was basically doing part-time jobs while I was working full-time on this. We share an apartment and pinch pennies where we could. It wasn't the best situation for Teddy, and he did an amazing work. Sometimes I think I couldn't do what he did. There was a period of time before Rogue Legacy when I had a job between products and I was just so spent. I couldn't work on any side products when I got home, so that gave me a real appreciation of what he did. Rogue Legacy's journey to the public eye began on Steam Greenlight, a platform that allowed the gaming community to vote on which indie game should be released on Steam. This was a crucial first step for a place to game before a vast audience of potential adventurers. Yet getting notice on Greenlight was no simple feat. Enter the unexpected allies, YouTube Let's Players, these digital bars who record their exploits and musings of their journey into games, became the champion of Rogue Legacy's early promotion. Despite all these challenges, the Lee Brothers' perseverance paid off. Rogue Legacy's development costs were kept remarkably low, at approximately 14878 Even more astonishing, the game recouped these costs in the first hour of its release, as if the universe itself had decided to tip its hat to their efforts. This financial windfall allowed Kenny and Teddy to transition from a mode of survival to one of planning future escapades, free from the fiscal shadows that loomed over their earlier endeavors. The launch date of June 27th, 2013 finally arrived, and thus begins our retrospective. The game whisks you straight into the tutorial, all bathed in a sepia glow that screams prologue louder than a town crier with a new bell. As the opening credits roll, you're gently nudged into mastering the basic controls. You meander through the castle until you find yourself in the king's chamber, where the only option is to, well, dispatch him. And just like that, the title screen unfurls. It's a brilliant hook leaving you curious and eager to press start, only to dash back into the castle and do it all over again. This inaugural run is likely to last a mere minutes, quickly revealing just how challenging this escapade will become. With eyeballs firing lasers, specters floating ominously, wizards casting spells, and even paintings launching spinning attacks, it's a veritable carnival of chaos. After succumbing to a nasty, you'll be visiting a title screen again. This time, however, it's to select the next heir to brave the castle. 
with a handy timeline to trace the lineage of your brave, if somewhat short-lived family. But the real treasure lies in the skill tree. You might find yourself short on gold for that first upgrade. I certainly was. The skill tree isn't just a mechanical progression. It flows seamlessly into the narrative. These are traits passed down to the next generation. The tree you plant inspires the next to gather more gold, and the new mage training hall imparts arcane wisdom to your descendants. It integrates so beautifully, more so than your typical RPG where your characters simply get stronger. The third entry into the castle is where the journey begins for real. The major pieces are now in place and the loop is complete. Enter the castle, perish, upgrade, repeat. The ultimate goal is to unlock the giant door you glimpse at the start, requiring four keys from, you guessed it, four formidable bosses. The castle's layout shifts with every entry, so locations are ever-changing. Navigating your character through this domain requires a bit of a learning curve due to the physics. Some might describe these controls as floaty, and I count myself among them. You can leap quite high even without extra abilities, which feels a tad awkward at first. It reminded me of those slippery platformers like Bubsy. In the air, you can move side to side with surprising agility, yet after a while it dawned on me that this was intentional. With the barrage of projectiles, enemies, and stationary hazards, it can feel like a bullet hell at times. These physics allow for dodging with more freedom than a typical system with dodge rolls, complemented by upgrades like the dash and the double jump. Perhaps tight controls aren't always the answer. This delightful jank gives it a feel of a big budget flash game, which makes perfect sense considering the developer's history. Once you get the hang of movement, combat is deceptively simple. Jump, dash, hack, and slash. Everyone can swing a sword. Some are better at it than others, of course. What truly sets the classes apart is their special abilities. Some brandish a shield, others hurl axes, and a few dabble in spells. These talents are thoughtfully noted when selecting a descendant. While the descendant system sounds great, after all, each family member being unique with their own quirks and combination of skills sounds fantastic. Alas, in practice, the characters quickly become a blur, much like a peasant's laundry on a windy day. This sameness is compounded by the fact that some classes are clearly superior. The mage and its magical kin, for instance, are best left to gather dust. Their health is predictably low, but their mana pool is also meager, and with sluggish methods of replenishment, they rarely make it far. Then there is a special class unlocked early, called the Miner, who is terrible in all stats, but has the unique ability to reveal chests and journals on the map. If one were inclined to use this and employ the architect to lock down the mansion on the next run, it might prove useful for completionists. Personally, I never found it worth the bother. The Shinobi, however, is quite the boon in the early game. It's how I managed to vanquish the forest boss, Alexander, a tad prematurely, with massive damage output and extra speed. They are forced to be reckoned with, though at the sacrifice of the ability to land critical hits. Another viable class in the early to mid game, should you chart the course to unlock them, is the dragon. With the ability to soar through the air, exploration becomes a breeze, and dodging attacks or enemies is a doodle. Most fairy chests require nary a thought. They can also breathe fireballs, though these projectiles don't pass through walls. The downsides? Very low health, and without the ability to crit with spells, new game plus enemies become veritable damage sponges. The lack of a downward attack is also strangely annoying. Classes like the knight are just plain more advantageous, with higher health and attack, an attack that notably doesn't run out. In fact, the only viable class that's at the magic variety, you unlock, is a spell sword, which regains lots of mana, while attacking with the blade and is multiplied by crits. This lack of viable variety is largely what leads to monotony. You might have multiple choices in choosing the next dependent, but you know there's only a couple of real options. What truly etched itself into my memory were the traits. These are the little quirks, blessings, or curses that truly spice up the adventure. This might be the only game where you can play a hero who's nearsighted or has a touch of OCD. A ladder, amusingly enough, is a boot, allowing you to regain mana from smashing objects to bits. Others are purely cosmetic, like being bald, which, while not particularly heroic, certainly adds character. These traits can dramatically alter gameplay. Dwarfism shrinks you down, making you a diminutive, yet elusive target, perfect for squeezing through tight sparts. Conversely, being a giant never seemed to work in my favor, as it simply made me a large target. Vertigo, on the other hand, flips the screen upside down, rendering the game nigh unplayable, a peculiar challenge for those who are stout-hearted. Then there are traits like Alzheimer's, which removes the large pause screen map, stereo blindness that gives the castle walls a vaporwave vibe, or even IBS, which is exactly as you might imagine. It's like drawing cards from a deck, indifferent to how far you ventured on this quest. 
Sometimes you'll be dealt a hand that makes you want to tap out before it even begins. Yet on occasion, you'll hit the jackpot, a god run where you're playing out of your skin. The rooms align like stars, and your character becomes a whirlwind of destruction, tearing through everything in their path. Even the bosses, the first of which might take hours of gameplay to reach alone. Not because they are far, but due to being unable to survive and their location not being static. Then beating them is a whole other matter. The first boss you'll likely meet is Kyder, a colossal eyeball with a penchant for bullet hell theoretics. This fellow is your first introduction to the chaos that lies ahead. At first glance, his attack patterns seem as intimidating as a dragon's glare. But with a rational mind and a wide perspective, you'll see that his bullets are more bark than bite. They arc, twirl, and sometimes just zip ahead. Everything follows a pattern, and therein lies the secret to nearly all combat in this game. Once an enemy shows its hand, it won't change, rewarding those who become familiar with its dance. Alexander, for instance, a fiery skull who seems like a simplified version of Kyder, he shoots flames in a predictable cross pattern, never deviating from his script, even as he chases you and summons minions. Perhaps it was my growing familiarity with the game, but Alexander felt like a gentler challenge. Each boss resides in a distinct section of the castle, Kyder, in the central hub, Alexander in the forest, Ponce in the Maya, and Heroditus in the darkness. Despite the castle's ever-shifting architecture, you won't lose your way. The forest is always to the far right, the Maya above and the darkness below. This clever design choice ensures players remain oriented, never feeling too set back, always knowing where to head for another shot at glory. For those eager to save time on their salty runbacks, the architect offers a tempting proposition. Lock down the castle for another run in exchange for 60% of your gold. This is a boon after reaching a boss or other significant location, as there's always a teleporter conveniently nearby. As one of the loading screens suggests, it's an excellent way to practice against the bosses. Everything about this game's design really is crafted to meditate the frustration that comes with a roguelike. Rogue Legacy unfurls its tail with a visual style that can be enchanting, blending retro charm with a dash of clever detail to whisk players into its whimsical and challenging realm. The game dons a pixel art aesthetic, reminiscent of the beloved 16-bit era, offering a warm embrace of nostalgia to those who fondly recall the games of past years. With vibrant and expressive character sprites breathing life into the ever-shifting castle, and its peculiar denizens. Each section of the castle flaunts its own distinct theme, from the shadowy nooks of the land of darkness to the middle-toned greenery of the forest, ensuring that players are consistently greeted with new and delightful sights. Yet in the bustling bazaar of modern gaming, where pixel art has become as common as a wizard's pointy hat, Rogue Legacy's graphics can feel a touch stale, what was once a charming nod to the past now risks blending into the sea of similar style. The overuse of pixel art in today's games can sometimes strip it of its nostalgic magic, leaving this narrator yearning for something that stands out amidst the pixelated crowd. While at the time this game certainly captured the essence of retro charm, it now finds itself lost in a throng of titles that have donned the same pixelated cloak. The developers appear to have agreed, as its sequel took on a hand-drawn approach. But in fairness, beyond the now formulaic pixel art lies a layer of visual wit that works with both gameplay and narrative. As stated before, the game employs visual cues to reflect character traits, adding a sprinkle of immersion and a dollop of humor to the mix. A hero who is nostalgic, for instance, views the world through sepia-toned lens, as if trapped in an old photograph, while the colorblind trait washes the world in grayscale. Its thoughtful detail crafts an experience that is as pleasing to the eyes as it is engaging to the mind. I ain't very good at this game in the end. But with enough patience and even setting goals besides defeating bosses, you can build that manor higher and higher to grow stronger. I know I said I beat the forest boss early, but that was partly luck. I got an easy run in a great shinobi. After this, I stalled for quite a while. I realized I'm quite bad at this game. It took a significant number of upgrades to get the strength to overcome the challenges. I was dying from regular enemies in the Maya and getting nowhere close to the boss. I just hit a wall and was getting nowhere. My biggest mistake was not paying enough attention to health and attack. I kept on wanting to unlock new classes for the sake of this video, also thinking I'd find something great, and finally not wanting to become overpowered. On top of this, I was getting particularly bad luck with castle construction. Bad maze-like layouts and even a couple where seemingly the entire castle had spikes in the floor as every other room. The levels of monsters can also be very misleading. Your own level just corresponds to how many upgrades you bought not your actual attack and damage like one might assume. A level 35 monster 
can swat a level 89 hero aside with the ease of a cat batting at an annoying piece of string. Finally, I started to upgrade health and attack more. This does lead us to the biggest fissure between a roguelike and a rogue light. A roguelike tells the players to get good. All progress would be lost upon death. Of course, the roguelike genre boasts many other defining traits, but over the years, its most notorious feature has become the complete loss of progress upon death, a relic from a time before the invention of the save button. The roguelite takes the edge off. You do lose progress, but get to come back stronger. It empathizes and allows the player varying levels of means to overcome a challenge. It's not as if this game even allows actual progress if your run resembled a jester at a court banquet. Sometimes I couldn't buy a single upgrade and lost the little money I had to the Grim Reaper at the door. Even someone like myself, who never got very good at Rogue Legacy, was able to get through the bosses with enough patience. This reflects its Souls-like inspiration. While skill is paramount, when all else fails, there's always the option of brute force with the grind to upgrade weapons. Slowly, I bolstered my attack and health until foes at once seemed invincible, crumbled before my newfound might. For all the chatter about how the Soul series reintroduced challenge, it also made an entire genre more approachable. Of course, we could also credit the RPG's genre itself. But here in Rogue Legacy, like the Souls games, it's about your build and not your level number itself. So, there I was, facing sub-level 40 enemies with an embarrassingly high level of 133. Not a true testament to raw skill, but Ponce was vanquished and I could finally move on. The Land of Darkness went a lot smoother, with only a handful of deaths before getting a good layout and a bit more strength, even managing to make it with full health thanks to some restorative chicken legs. Now when it comes to bosses, Hero Ditus is the creme de la creme, at least in my humble opinion. The introduction is a fine work of suspense, with a singular slime expanding into its debut, thanks to a drip of many other slimes jumping upon it, accompanied by a sound reminiscent of an overly leaky faucet. One becomes two, two becomes four, and before long, the arena is a veritable jamboree of jellies. Add to this the mages, those spell-slinging nuisances who break out every time a slime comes apart, and you've got yourself a delightful pandemonium. The beauty of this battle lies in its spaciousness, offering ample opportunity for a bit of dash and dance. One might even call it a dash dance. It's all about the footwork, really. Slash those mages and keep an eye on those little blighters lest they catch you unawares. All around, a truly splendid encounter, and without a doubt, my favorite in the game. With that colossal slime dispatched, only the final boss remains, lurking somewhere in the labyrinthian corridors of your ancestors' abode. As you descend the platforms, you can't help but notice the ancient sign proclaiming, Down attack this! Still hanging in the air like a persistent ghost, unteetered by the passage of millennia. At the summit lies journal entry number 25, the final piece of the puzzle. In my own quest, I managed to stumble across a mere trio of these elusive entries, not counting 25. And it seems that in the fickle world of New Game Plus, they ceased to appear altogether. Perhaps fortune was not on my side, or perhaps the castle simply enjoys its secrets too much. Reflecting, one might wonder, what exactly is the story of Rogue Legacy? Why do we embark on this perilous journey? The narrative is as subtle as a thief in the night, whispered through the corridors and told indirectly. Even the prologue unfurls like a silent film, leaving us with only these scattered journals to piece the tale together. These entries, hidden within the castle's ever-changing walls, are as much a matter of luck as skill to find. For those determined to uncover every scrap of lore, the minor class might be your best bet, assuming the fates smile upon your rolls. Personally, the digital pages of the wiki is enough for me. To recap, our adventure began with a sepia-toned knight, entering the castle and confronting a figure who appeared to be a king. Standing before a fountain, journal entry number one picks up the tale from there, inviting us to unravel the mystery one entry at a time. Treason! An assassin has wounded my father the king. To bring back order to the kingdom, he has sent my siblings and I on a quest to save him. Together, we will venture into the cursed woods and enter Castle Hampson. This cursed council has stood on the edge of the woods since time immemorial, but rumors say that within it dwells an item which will cure any ailment. Tonight, I will get a head start over my brothers and sisters 
and set forth on my quest while they lay asleep. To fail this quest would be an embarrassment to my name. This entry is clearly written by a prince or a princess. Being a child of the king, as a tale unfolds, our regal scribe begins to refer to themselves as swordsmen. Entry number two states the prince's mission was to find a cure for something or the other to gain his father's inheritance. Although I am the eldest child, I am not my father's favorite. I have always known that he planned to leave me with nothing. But if I find the cure, everything will change. The victor will learn nothing less than the throne upon his passing. Upon my ascension, my wife and my child will move back into the royal quarters, back to the royal city, where we once again will be treated with the respect we deserve. No longer will we stand for the gossip and the petty slander of my cousins. The other dukes shall bow as we pass, but I am getting ahead of myself. I must keep my priorities clear, conquer the castle, find the cure, and collect my reward. The following few entries comment on the grim reaper at the gate who takes your money. The fact the castle changes constantly. It's always night, and that the monsters take the pants of the dead as their own. Many others simply provide hints like the direction of the different sections of the castle. By entry number 14, things take a turn for the philosophical, pondering whether the castle has the power to make people forget their past, or perhaps keeps them alive for an inordinate amount of time. I've been methodically clearing the demons in these rooms in my quest to slay the next guardian, but I'm losing track of time and other things. As I entered the tower, I felt time stand still, or perhaps that is the vertigo talking. I was never keen on heights, or was I? I am finding it increasingly difficult to remember my past. I remember being a famous adventurer. My martial prowess surpassed all my brothers, that I am sure of. While they spent their days buried in their bookish studies, I was out killing brigands and monsters. I always wondered why my father favored them over me. Isn't it always the opposite of fairy tales? Fortune favors the bold, not the insipid intellectual, or something like that. Man, I would love to see my brothers try to outthink my sword in their face. After this, the writer speaks about journeying into the darkness below to slay the final beast in a locked door. But upon entering, all his dreams are dashed. I never knew what treasure lay in this castle. I only knew that it would cure the king. Who could have suspected it would be the fountain of youth? I expected a monster to greet me at the dais, a foe of unimaginable strength. I imagined it would take all my strength to best him. But when I entered the castle and saw my father, the king, sitting atop the dais with goblet in hand, I knew all was lost. He would never die, and I would never be his heir. There are no words to express what I feel. And that brings us to where we stand today. A descendant of eons later, reading journal entry number 25. Today marks the rest of eternity. I never knew what treasure lay in this castle, just that it would cure the king of his illness. Who would have known it would have been the fountain of youth, a myth which grants one eternal life. As I look down on the body of the king, I realize that it is inevitable. Children will always answer for their father's sins. I entered this castle as a swordsman, a savior, but all I have left is a rogue's legacy. I can feel your anger, but no, it was not I who sent your family to ruin. The moment the king set foot within this castle, the royal coffers were emptied by Karen. My family, all families, had lost hope for a better life. And in my mind's eye, I foresaw only desperation and poverty ravage the country. There was nothing for me to go back to. To my children and my children's children, here I sit, impassive, immortal, and await thee. The barbarian places the book back on the table. The door creaks open, and destiny awaits. There stands Johannes framed by towering stained glass windows that blaze with vibrant colors, depicting knights and skeletons locked in eternal combat beneath the radiant glow of the Holy Grail. He poses a singular, weighty question. Why do you wish to fight me? 
how many sons and daughters have been lost in your pathetic attempts at revenge. It was the king who brought ruin to your country, not I. He lied to us. He said he was wounded, yet it was only time that threatened him. He pitted his children against one another, sacrificed everything to satisfy his own selfish desires, and in the end, left us penniless and alone. So I took the only option left to me. I rejected King and Country, and chose a new family instead. Johannes Chops, unleashing a torrent of axes in bewildering patterns, a storm of steel and fury, Yet the barbarian bolstered by an abundance of health weathers the onslaught with stoic resolve. With a flurry of sword swings, Johannes is swiftly felled, and from his defeated form spills chicken legs and mana potions. Thankfully, despite my barbarian's electrophobia, the paltry remains blissfully stationary. But Johannes' body fades, and his voice reverberates through the chamber like thunder. You think you have slain me? I have lived over a thousand years and shall endure for ten thousand more. Alexander, Kaida, Ponce de Leon. I was not the first hero to reach the fountain, but I will be the last. The fountain crumbles into dust, and from the haze emerges Johannes anew, transformed as any self-respecting final boss should be. He has absorbed the fountain's power, becoming bigger, badder, and decidedly spikier. With vengeance in his eyes, he drifts across the room, summoning a thousand knives from the void to sweep across the floor. A leap and a hop, guided by a keen eye, make evasion a mere trifle. In his larger form, Johannes moves like an ungreased wheel. His attacks telegraphed with the subtlety of a marching band. He raises his sword. One might catch a few winks before needing to dodge. Yet he is not without his crafty tricks. When he slams his blade into the ground, spears erupt across the room threatening to skira the unweary. But fear not, for we can bounce upon his head with our trusty pogo sword, dealing damage with every hop. Soon he succumbs to our blade, his expression one of shock rather than rage. Sunlight breaks through the sky, as if the world itself is curious about what has transpired. Seconds stretch into eons as everything culminates in this moment. Centuries of training, lives sacrificed, all for a revenge whose original crime has long been forgotten by the one who stands here today. The dark form crumples to the ground, and for a fleeting moment one might swear they see his life force depart this world. Then, in a sudden burst, gold doubloons, diamonds, and even bags of money spill forth. Without a care, the barbarian gathers the spoils and exits stage left, but not before smashing what little remains in the room from the brawl. Perhaps with the destruction of the fountain, Johannes had broke the curse for good. Rogue Legacy is not simply a tale of greed, but of trying to live up to a family's name. Here, Legacy is not merely a name passed down through the generations, but a heavy mantle of expectation. Each descendant, sword in hand, treads the path of their ancestors, striving to triumph where others have stumbled. This relentless cycle of inheritance underscores the profound burden of living up to the past, of proving oneself worthy in the eyes of those who came before. This is what Johannes, wanted to accomplish more than anything. Were they driven by greed? Perhaps as the prologue hints with. Yet the journals reveal a deeper turmoil. A man haunted by his inability to meet his father's expectations, seizing what he saw as his chance for redemption. Johannes, too, was ensnared by the cycle. His family treated as outcasts, whispered about in corners, seemingly due to his father's rejection. Whether he deserves such treatment is left to speculation for we only have his side of the tale. And even if we were to assume he did, he was not wholly self-deserving, despite what the prologue might suggest. He yearned for his wife, children, and cousins to join him in the rural city, to carve out better lives and brighter futures. It's easy to dismiss his quest as mere greed, but the harsh truth is that money is as essential as water for survival. Indeed, in many places, it is the key to accessing clean water. Why this entire time we've been collecting these very riches to train the next of kin for battle? Yet the king, he had the greatest greed of all, the desire for eternal life, going so far as to fake his own ailment to get an opening to leave. The king's refusal to relinquish power and allow the next generation to forge their own paths was his ultimate folly. Johannes arrived, 
seeking to secure his family's future and win his father's favor, only to find nothing left to salvage. When the king traded all his wealth for eternal life, he had traded his children's own futures with it. Johannes then was only left with despair and committed his worst offense, murdering the king, because, as he stated in the final journal, And in my mind's eye, I foresaw only desperation and poverty ravaged the country. There was nothing for me to go back to. This act, however, ensnared his family in a new curse, a cycle of revenge. The exact nature of this vengeance is elusive. Was it for abandonment, financial ruin, or murder? Each is plausible, none entirely wrong. Over generations, the tale twisted into a mythic saga, each iteration further obscuring the original truth. Now the battle has ended, with 132 children sacrificed to this relentless cycle of retribution. Yet for those who thirst for adventure unquenched, there's more to explore. You're whisked back to a brand new title screen, now bathed in the golden glow of a new dawn, with the logo sporting a jaunty crown. Yes, the game offers a new game plus mode. All your hard-won progress carries over for these devilishly difficult challenges. Good thing too, because I had only found about five blueprints and a couple of runes, and there are still many upgrades to buy if you like to tick off checklists. This task is made slightly easier by the additional 50% gold earned with each run, though this comes with a covet of even more formidable foes lurking in the shadows. The pluses you see stack into infinity, with no cap in sight. Everything just keeps getting stronger, and one imagines that at some point it becomes nigh unplayable when the upgrades run dry. I did hear tell of someone on New Game Plus 170, so it seems one can venture quite far indeed. The final question left then would be, is Rogue Legacy worth playing today? I'd venture to say yes, but only if you're interested in exploring the roots of the modern Rogue Light. It's undeniably one of the key figures in its development. For many people, it's the first Rogue like they ever played. The game does have its quirks, mind you. Chief among them are its floaty controls and the glacial pace at which upgrades are required. They're not to be overlooked. Additionally, it suffers from what one might call the Seinfeld is unfunny syndrome. Though this trope now bears the rather uninspired moniker, once original, now common title. Rogue Legacy helped lay the foundation for the genre we know today, so its quality of life features and rough edges are all the more apparent. The simple truth is, if you're inclined to try Rogue Legacy, you might as well go with its sequel, aptly named Rogue Legacy 2, released in 2022. It builds upon nearly a decade of genre evolution, and enhancing everything its predecessors and peers have stacked up since the first game. Rogue Legacy stands not merely as a game, but as a pivotal moment in the grand history of the modern roguelike. It wove together the delightful chaos of procedurally generated worlds with the allure of lineage-based character progression. This clever concoction set a new foundation for the genre, much like a particularly well-brewed cup of tea. Its knack for balancing relentless challenge with the sweet satisfaction of progress ensnared players' imaginations and lit a fire under developers spurring them to explore uncharted territories within the roguelike realm. The heritage of Rogue Legacy is one of innovation and influence, an example of how a single game can redefine a genre and ignite a creative revolution in the world of gaming. Hey there, thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please consider dropping a like, subscribing, leaving a comment, or even ringing that bell for more. It really helps. This one was difficult to put together. I had a lot of personal issues crop up in real life and got a bit burnt out on top of it. I do have ideas for the next video. I'm thinking either Monster Rancher or a Looney Tunes game, hopefully coming out a bit faster than this one did. Yet, I also am drawn to the idea of doing a super long, ultra comprehensive essay on a gamer series. I guess we'll see what the future brings. See you next time. Take care.